What in the heck is post-cycle therapy and why is everybody doing it wrong? By the end of this video, you guys will have a much deeper understanding of how our bodies make testosterone naturally, how that's broken whenever we're exposed to testosterone from outside the body and how we try to fix it. My name is Dr. Alex and I'm a board certified urologist and fellowship trained men's health specialist. My entire practice is designed and dedicated to helping men live their best quality of life. And honestly, this YouTube channel is just an extension of that. And today we're talking about post-cycle therapy and really how do our bodies make testosterone naturally. There are gonna be five key points we're gonna hit today. Number one, how do our bodies naturally make testosterone? Number two, how do we damage that whenever we take external testosterone or other anabolics? Three, how can we limit that damage and potentially restore that natural function? Four, what are some of the most commonly used medications in this setting? And number five, my favorite, my personal editorial take on the subject. Okay, so starting off, we need to lay a foundation. Whenever we're talking about enhanced athletes, people usually fall into one of two categories. The first category is something that we call blasting and cruising. I can't believe I'm a board certified urologist and I'm legit talking about blasting and cruising right now. My mother is so proud of me. Blasting and cruising essentially means that an athlete is taking a very high dose of anabolics for a limited set period of time in an effort to try and reduce dying as fast as possible and then backing down, not to nothing, but to a lower, let's say, testosterone replacement dose for a number of weeks or months before going back onto their next cycle. So we have the blast and then we have the cruise. Now, really, this is for what we call lifers, people that are totally dedicated to staying on this sort of regimen for the rest of their existence, which depending on how much gear they're taking might not be very long. Ronic, I best describe this degree of uh, risk tolerance as a uh, we ball. Now, for those athletes who have, let's say, a little bit lower risk tolerance, uh, we have something that is called true cycling, where an athlete will take a dose of anabolic steroids for a period of time, again, limited in nature, and then they will go back to nothing, to their own natural function. And by most accounts, this is how steroids were originally used many, many years ago back in the golden era of bodybuilding. Now, I will typically describe this degree of risk tolerance as being more sane. Other people will describe it as being filthy casuals. The decision is up to you. But the concept of post-cycle therapy is really aimed at these athletes, the people who want to come completely off of anabolics and try to regain or restore as much natural function as possible. This could be because they have a lower risk tolerance. This could be because they want kids in the future. But regardless, the point of today's talk is to try and go into the science behind this and give evidence-based strategies for approaching it. Not just my TikTok comments, which to be honest are completely horrifying. All right, so how do we make testosterone? Well, in order to figure that out, we need to review something called the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. And the way things work is like this. You have this brain structure called the hypothalamus, which kind of sits in the middle of things. And the hypothalamus does a lot of important stuff, but we don't care about any of that, except for the secretion of something called GNRH, or gonadotropin-releasing hormone. The hypothalamus releases GnRH in a pulsatile fashion for it to then act on the anterior pituitary, which is a gland that sits kind of in the front of the brain. The anterior pituitary then responds to the GnRH and secretes LH and FSH, which stand for luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone respectively. Both of these hormones then travel down to the testicles where they exert their action. Luteinizing hormone binds to the Leydig cells in the testicle, which are responsible for making testosterone, while follicle-stimulating hormone activates the Sertoli cells, which are responsible for making sperm. Thus, you get the end products of this whole process, which is testosterone creation and sperm production. Now, in male patients, this generally cruises along at a set rate. Now, this doesn't mean that you can't improve that testosterone production through lifestyle, through exercise, through diet, stop drinking like a fish. But generally speaking, there is not a chronologic surge associated with this axis. This stands in direct contrast to females who have something called an LH surge that can lead to the release of an egg once a month. And this relative hormonal consistency is why I, as a man, compared to my spouse, who is female, how many people you think lost money on that bet, Ronick? Can make it through a month without dragging all my loved ones through a living emotional hell of a roller coaster. But misogyny aside, 
Despite not having a natural surge as a men, we still have to have built-in brakes to keep this system regulated. And those brakes come in the form of something called negative feedback, where some of those in endocrine products actually have a negative effect on the production of them later down the line. For example, testosterone itself exerts an inhibitory effect on both the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary, shutting down GnRH and LH and FSH secretion once it gets to a certain level. Estrogen actually has the same effect. We'll talk about that whole testosterone to estrogen conversion thing a little bit later on, but the idea is this. Okay, now we have our breaks and everything can just live in perfect harmony forever, right? Well, the unfortunate reality is that this delicate system is about as reliable as F. Jepstein would be as a Girl Scout troop leader. It can be broken by a number of things, including obesity, alcohol intake, and you guessed it, exogenous steroid exposure. And again, why is that? The moment you pin an anabolic steroid, it immediately floods your body and binds to all the androgen receptors, which is great. That's how you build muscle, right? Well, unfortunately, it also binds to the androgen receptors in the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary, again, shutting down GnRH and LH and FSH secretion. That whole blood-brain barrier thing that people get really excited about, yeah, steroids don't care about that. They jump across it in a heartbeat. And again, that isn't even accounting for what happens due to aromatization. What is aromatization? Well, our bodies are full of this enzyme called aromatase, which is an enzyme that converts excess testosterone into estrogen and actually excess estrogen back into testosterone. It's trying to create a balance. And the truth is, is that whenever you take high doses of exogenous anabolic steroids, those are often going to be converted into estrogen and estrogen byproducts. Increase in estrogen, Increase in crying at Lifetime movies also shuts down your hypothalamus and your pituitary. And fun fact, aromatase is concentrated in fat cells, but everybody has a different aromatization potential. For example, my body loves estrogen more than Diddy loves baby oil. But that's fine. That's what an astrozole is for. We'll get there later. Roddick, we need to start a whole series where it's just me trying to explain these concepts to the Trend Twins. We would totally turn this tiny exam closet into a freaking rage room. So again, Androgen exposure alone is going to shut this down. The estrogen conversion and subsequent inhibition is just the cherry on top. Okay, great. Your natural testosterone is now shut off. What does this cause? Well, in addition to shutting down natural testosterone production itself, you also get a loss of testicular size. You get an inhibition of natural sperm production, and you also get some serious imbalances when it comes to testosterone and estrogen. Now, usually these effects are temporary, but with subsequent cycles and with an increasing age, because guess what? Everything gets worse when you get older, damage can accumulate. And I'm just talking about the HPG axis here. We aren't even touching all the lipid, liver, and cardiac damage that can occur from steroids over prolonged use. Not that any of you really care, you just don't want your balls to shrink, which is why we're talking about this today. But we do want to limit the damage to the HPG axis from these compounds, which is where PCT enters the conversation. So is PCT mandatory? Well, no, it's not, but it can really help. Let's talk about natural recovery. How long does it take to get natural testosterone production back after a cycle of anabolic steroids? The truth is, is that nobody really has that data because you aren't going to find a study looking at enhanced athletes over time because most of you trust your dealer more than you trust your doctor. And the problem is, is that enhanced athletes are just a very heterogeneous population. One cycle of 500 milligrams a week of testosterone does not equal the guy who just injected an entire Mexican pharmacy worth of drugs into his ass. That's like comparing apples and oranges with the oranges being the well in the Mexican pharmacy guy's ass. So long story short, we're not sure. It probably takes several months. And if we look at data from the fertility world, we know that men that are on TRT who stop in an effort to regain natural fertility may take up to a year to have a normal semen analysis again, if it comes back at all. And let's be honest, none of you started looking into gear because you're patient people. Again, enter PCT, medications that are designed to reboot your natural function as quickly as possible. These include medications that you've probably heard of, like Novadex, Clomid, Enclomiphene. Maybe you've heard something like HCG, Anastrozole. These are all different drugs that manipulate your natural hormonal axis in a way to try and get things started on their own. 
Again, a great idea, but if Reddit and my TikTok comments are to be believed, literally everyone's doing it wrong. I often hear about guys doing a four week or a two week PCT, which honestly is about as effective as a California firefighter trying to piss on a fire in the Palisades to put it out. You know, assuming any of them can pee standing up anyways. If that joke offended you, please let me know in the comments so we can all laugh at you. So when we're talking about timing, keep this in mind. It can take anywhere up to 40 days for a single dose of 500 milligrams of testosterone cypionate to clear someone's system. People will quote a half-life of eight days, but you have to remember a half-life is just the amount of time for serum concentrations to be cut in half. Half can still be a lot of anabolics depending on what you've been on. So in the medical and pharmacology world, we really wanna see about four to five half-lives before we can consider a drug being quote unquote cleared, at least mostly. So for setting expectations for proper PCT, this needs to be a prolonged course, really about as long or longer than most cycles. And why is that? Well, it just takes a lot of time for the drug itself to actually get out of your system and for the PCT to truly kick in. For example, if you're on cycle and you start taking Clomid while you're on it, it's not gonna do anything. The androgens that you're injecting are wildly overwhelming it. I see this all the time actually with people going to crappy TRT clinics who put them on Clomid while they're on TRT saying it's gonna preserve fertility. And then you actually draw labs on them. Their gonadotropins are absolutely zilch. PSA, if your TRT clinic has you on Clomid along with your injectable testosterone, find a new TRT clinic. So really, if we're talking about our appropriate duration of PCT, it needs to be at least two months, if not three. Because even when all that gear clears your system, you need time for your natural machinery to kick back in. So what medications do we rely on? This video is not designed to be a cookbook to give you the perfect PCT regimen because, well, I'm a real doctor and I have a license at stake here. But we are going to cover some of those commonly cited compounds and talk about why that mechanism may be helpful. The first one of these is a drug that I prescribe every single day in my clinic, primarily for my fertility patients, called n clomiphene citrate. And n clomiphene is the new kid on the block compared to its older brother, clomiphene citrate, also known as Clomid. Clomid is extremely common and it's, it's an okay compound, but Clomid actually consists of two subcompounds, the trans isomer, which is in clomiphene, which does all the heavy lifting on the guy side, and then zooclomiphene, which is the cis isomer, which really doesn't convey any benefit for male patients. So most of us who are up to date with modern men's health use in clomiphene exclusively. And what in clomiphene does is that it actually blocks the estrogen receptor at the hypothalamus and the pituitary, which can help promote secretion of GnRH and FSH and LH. I give this to my fertility patients all the time because I want them to make more sperm, but it can be used for that same basic mechanism to promote natural testosterone production in someone who is coming off a cycle of anabolics. Now, enclomiphene is very estrogenic, and so most people will need to add on this second compound, which is one known as anastrozole. Anastrozole, aka Arimidex, is an old school compound that is designed to prevent the conversion of testosterone to estrogen. It was originally a breast cancer drug because many breast cancers were estrogen sensitive and we were trying to shut that down in females, but the truth is, is that it's an extremely effective compound in the TRT and enhanced space. And it can be helpful as you start to add in something like Clomid or Enclomiphene to limit your estrogen exposure by giving a little bit of Arimidex or Anastrozole with it. This is all theoretical. This is not medical advice. Ronick, hit the disclaimer. But remember, Anastrozole is potent. A little dab will do you. Okay, so if Clomid and Enclomiphene can help restart natural LH and FSH production, where does that leave things like Nolvidex or HCG? Well, Novidex became popular because although it is primarily a peripheral estrogen receptor blocker compared to clomiphene and enclomiphene, which are central, it's actually more potent centrally than enclomiphene or clomid. The problem is it's actually potent everywhere. It's actually really, really potent in the periphery. And so when you take Novidex, your body basically can't really see estrogen that effectively. And so the reason why I don't like it is because patients will get low estrogen symptoms when they're on it. And so why would you try to take a medication to restore normalcy that makes you feel like crap because it's blocking all the effects of estrogen? Remember, estrogen is both cardioprotective and neuroprotective. You need a normal amount of estrogen. You just don't want as much as my body seems to make whenever I'm on TRT. So for that reason, Novidex has been popular in PCT regimens historically, but people that persist and demand on its utilization now are really just relying on old Jimbro culture and not modern medicine. 
Now we get to one of my favorite compounds, but one of the more often misused ones, which is HCG, also known as human chorionic gonadotropin. Listen, I love HCG, another compound that I prescribe all day, every day in my clinic. And what HCG is, is it's essentially a stand-in for LH, also known as luteinizing hormone. HCG can be injected subcutaneously, and it absolutely pounds the LH receptors, which means that you are going to get a significant boost in natural testosterone production. The problem is, is that HCG actually has an inhibitory effect on GnRH and on LH and FSH secretion. So if you have a patient who is taking HCG, it actually will shut down their natural LH and FSH secretion. And the whole point of PCT is to try and restore you to normalcy, which HCG really won't do. So is HCG a great drug? Yes, but not for the point of PCT. It's a great drug to take actually while you are on cycle to try and keep your testicles from just starving to death, but it has limited application in the true sense of post-cycle therapy. And yes, HCG totally overrides Clomid, and so the old papers, including some that I wrote that recommended using HCG and Clomid together are really just outdated at this point. So are there other medications that can be used for PCT? Yes, there are. You can go and look at actually a lot of commentary from Dave Palumbo. Yeah, the Palumboism, the guy that you know, gave the entire name to a distended gut that was thought to be due to growth hormone and insulin, but really isn't. We'll get into that later. And he'll often talk about using something called injectable minotropins to improve fertility. Minotropins are great from a fertility perspective, but really all it is is just a mishmash of LH and FSH that's been purified from the urine of menopausal women. Who cares where you got it if it works, right? And so the benefit of minotropins is that it introduces FSH, which is something that is hard to get unless you're specifically getting prescribed FSH, but Honestly, all of our fertility data shows that it's rare that you actually need direct FSH stimulation in order to facilitate spermatogenesis. I know that doesn't make sense. It shouldn't make sense looking at a textbook, but that's the real world. And again, minotropins have HCG, which will inhibit natural testosterone production. So does it make sense in a PCT setting? Mm, not really. But the truth is, is that if you've stuck with this video all the way through, you now have a better understanding of PCT and how your natural testosterone and sperm production is supposed to work than most doctors. So let us know down in the comments, have you heard of PCT before? What is the most ridiculous PCT regimen you've ever seen anybody write down? And uh, while you're at it, go ahead, hit the like button, subscribe, all those things, help out the algorithm. And until next time, this is Dr. Alex signing off.